Hello everyone, um, this is Rene Bernard and welcome to Reproducibility Teach. Um, this lesson is about reducing experimental bias in preclinical studies, why, where, and how. And we will also talk a little bit about these clinical studies, so stay tuned. Um, so let's talk first what is experimental bias and how does it affect our experiments. So bias is any tendency which prevents unprejudiced considerations of a research question. And I have listed here several biases that may occur. And, uh, these are not all biases that exist, but uh, pretty uh, relevant ones. Some of them you may know or heard of, like gender bias or language bias in reporting. Others may be not so obvious, for instance, um, outcome reporting bias. So, for instance, uh, you only report uh, outcomes that fit your narrative, whereas other outcomes you just omit in your publication. Um, media attention bias, so we tend to cite or believe uh, certain publications um, much more if they are covered a lot by media. Um, yeah, uh, confirmation bias, we have a certain prejudice, we know that this drug must work or this uh, setup must work, therefore uh, we only select studies um, that uh, um, confirm this or uh, we only believe in um, experiments or series of experiments that again uh, confirm our bias that exists. So they come in a variety, but two of them I will focus today that will really uh, influence our experimental design and our outcome very often and uh, how to combat these. So we often um, have hypothesis-driven research and we know that this creates certain expectations. And that can cause some problems because these expected study outcomes can subtly alter uh, the experimenter's behavior and threaten our objectivity, which is called the experimenter also observer bias. The other one is uh, systematic error, a sampling bias, which is due to non-random sampling of uh, study subjects because these samples are not representative of the general population. So if you remember your statistics class, uh, we cannot, of course, test an entire uh, population. You know? um, therefore, we take samples out of this general population and then perform ex our experiments of them. And we can repeat this pretty often and get to certain results, or we just do it once with a large enough sample and um, or twice basically and um, get a certain result so if we introduce already a systematic error here the sampling is not random anymore and therefore our results are altered and the subsequent statistical testing is invalid uh, which makes our interpretation of the data uh, difficult and often unreliable so, but coming back to this observer bias, uh, why are we not immune against this? Well, we collect data points and sometimes also uh, we have to, um, in behavioral experiments, uh, judge a certain behavior. And so we see these, these numbers often coming in, which are, you know, perceived random. But our brains, you know, have a tendency to perceive sort of meaningful patterns or search for them in these, you know, unrelated events or uh, tests that we perform and make uh, something meaningful out of this meaningless noise. We all know this uh, when we look at clouds and see faces or other patterns or pictures from Mars or cakes where we all of a sudden see people in it, or also these images that uh, contain actually two different pictures depending on how long we look at it. So our subconscious is always trying to find an answer before we actually have done any testing. So it wants to get ahead of us a little bit, 
whether we want this or not. So some are more or less sensitive uh, towards this. So how can we trick our brain not into searching for patterns? Well, again, we, uh, it's, the secret is in the experimental design. We introduce randomness and apply measures that prevent patterns from occurring. And we apply blinding. So we make every experimental condition look the same. So it's kind of boring and the brain gives up and doesn't look for patterns anymore. And uh, we, the experimenters, regain our objectivity and judgment. So with measure measures are really proven to prevent against experimental bias. Uh, these are four, which are going to talk about today. Uh, randomization, uh, blinding, uh, concealed allocations of uh, treatment conditions, and a priori uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria. So if you look around your uh, lab, you find that many people don't randomize or blind their samples and they say like, oh, what's the big deal? Why, why should I do this? I would receive the same results. Well, meta research tells us otherwise. Uh, studies without randomization and blinding have inflated effect sizes and uh, less variability. So here we have a result from stroke researchers uh, coming from over 400 animals where they looked at the infarct volume, volume reduction after a certain uh, treatment and compared whether randomization, the blind conduct of the experiment or the blind uh, assessment uh, was performed or not. And you can see from the results that uh, the effect size is much, much more enlarged and less variable if uh, these measures are not applied. So uh, then you would be happy and say like, hey, they have a great outcome and you would come forward and then leads to, could lead to uh, new clinical studies that often fail. Why is this? Uh, it could be that uh, bias reduction methods were not applied in the preclinical testing. So, and this is not true for stroke only. Uh, basically, all research is at risk. Uh, these meta researchers have shown us whether well, it's Alzheimer's, multiple sclerosis, or Parkinson's. So, without blinding randomizations, these small studies that we perform in these preclinical studies produce excessive numbers of presumably false positive results that shift in our results and interpretation towards an effect, even though there is none. So now you say it's like, okay, this may be all true for uh, animal research, but um, I only do in vitro setups and these come with standardized plates. So I don't need to randomize because uh, that would only complicate my study. Again, a large multi-center study uh, um, showed that there is an edge effect that could be a major uh, factor leading to a decrease in uh, reproducibility and robustness. And there is an edge, uh, center to edge deviation and also in a number of cells and wells as well uh, within rows or within co columns. So uh, we need to consider this uh, also in the design of um, how we um, put our um, treatment conditions on a plate and cannot just do this well, without thinking. So how can I incorporate some randomness or uh, randomization in my study? What do I need to know? Well, there are several ways to randomize the studies. Study to, uh, two of them I will talk about today. Uh, one is the random, random, simple randomization, uh, where all samples are assigned in one step. Uh, and it's important that every subject has the same chance of being assigned to each treatment condition. So you have your animals, your cell culture plates on a well, uh, uh, wells on a plate, and uh, um, you assign them in one step after you have uh, given them a certain ID and then uh, you have completely randomized these uh, conditions. 
The other way is uh, called randomized block design. And this applies if you cannot um, finish the study like in one step, but for instance, have to perform this over multiple days or if other uh, variables apply that influence the outcome. This could be, for instance, also gender and uh, age sometimes, depending how you uh, set up your study. Um, so it's important that uh, um, each of these blocks then contains basically all uh, conditions, treatment conditions that uh, uh, apply. And there you have them also all randomized as in this case. So tools that will help you are uh, computer generated randomization lists or also from graphpath.com there is a, a, a quick table that you can produce that you can apply for your uh, randomization. If it comes to randomized block design, you need to remember that the block size must be a numeral factor of the number of conditions. So if you have three conditions, the block size needs to be um, a divider of this. So three, six, or nine, and so on. So sometimes if you have two conditions, I see many people also in methods section sometimes uh, reporting that they use a coin uh, flip for this. So which is not the best design and you should not really use it, especially considering that we have better tools. And uh, maybe you can think a moment about why this is a bad design and we'll come back to this later. So what about randomization techniques in in vitro research? Uh, again, you can vary your plate layout, um, but in a way also that you do not create new confounders. Like if you create, look at uh, panel A, uh, that's a bad design because uh, you have a left to right confounder here with these two conditions. Um, B would be a good design because it's very random, but of course in the execution error prone. Uh, C uh, shows a suitable compromise because you alternate two conditions uh, over the course of the entire uh, plate. So if you put too many conditions like in D, like four different ones on there, um, you actually have these edge effects because the repeats are not often enough. So you, uh, um, it's not ideal. And remember, if you cannot randomize it, try to block uh, things. Okay, this leads me to blinding techniques. So who should be blinded during the course of a study? Well, it depends on the different types of studies that uh, you're performing. If it comes to clinical trials, of course, the human subjects or patients participating uh, need to be blinded. In preclinical and also clinical trials, the researchers who conduct the experiments need to be blinded. Additionally, also in preclinical trials, technicians that help, animal facility staff, you know, uh, um, especially uh, people that are then involved with the evaluation should not be uh, um, um, in, in involved in um, or should be blinded. So as a general rule, as few as uh, as few people as possible should be unblinded. Again, clinical trials, uh, nurses, caregivers, families and friends of uh, patients should be blinded. Okay, uh, but what information should I conceal from these people? Well, uh, various different ones if you consider the design. So let me go through this list uh, to explain what I mean by this. So the experimental groups when assessing the outcome. Of course, if I know basically if I need to assess an outcome and for instance, behavioral test, and I know that this is the control drug, whereas this, the other one is the drug that I'm testing. 
it would influence uh, uh, my uh, my judgment and uh, that uh, needs to be concealed and blinded future treatment groups of subjects during a pre-treatment intervention so often we do a pre-treatment like uh, um, a surgery that we perform you know uh, um, on animals and subsequently we have uh, then the treatments groups on this model that we created but if already the person that uh, is doing this pre-treatment knows about these future treatment groups um, you give in a way too much information that should be concealed because it can influence the uh, um, outcome previous values when multiple observations are, are made over time so think of these lists that we have from each subject or animal where we see the outcomes um, from multiple tests and um, so again having like uh, this this prior in this information from another test again could influence how we uh, how much value we put on another outcome values of other outcomes from the same group um yeah so uh, again if we know that an animal is from um, a certain group and then it comes basically we pre are presented an animal from the same group we have this prior information all of a sudden and then we we already know our, our judgment it could be pre-clouded um, any information that provides clues about uh, the treatment groups so um, um, yeah this could be for instance uh, the drug solutions that are provided so I give an animal a clear solution the other one gets a little bit of cloudy or maybe a colored uh, solution then I know okay this is the one that is maybe harder to get in solution is probably the drug whereas the clear one is the control so again in the design it's very important to prevent these clues and information indicating that subjects are in the same group even if the group is blinded so this comes again to the abcd problem that exists so we we think we blinded animals uh, uh, or conditions and have then groups A and B and we don't know what this is but if we again know that uh, um, the, the, even if we don't know what conditions it is that, that we have uh, we have a tendency to uh, um, uh, judge um, subjects from the same group um, in this in the same way and again this leads to this reduced uh, um, um, variability that we talked about and with reduced variability we all know we also sudden are more likely to see an effect that is just not there so uh, unconscious bias in clinical trials uh, what exists there again uh, we have single blinded uh, trials uh, where the study subjects does not know what the treatment uh, uh he or she is receiving double blinded both the subject and the medical personnel and contact does not know do not know and in these randomized control tries uh you need to use a, a correct a concealed allocation technique to ensure double blinding so and i encourage every one of you to watch this uh, youtube video it's yeah entertaining and uh, also very illustrative uh, what needs to be considered and what can go wrong and how to do this right when it comes to allocation so concealed allocation in, in animal studies how do this does this work because uh, is that even necessary because uh, um, um, an animal sort of like does not really know what is assigned to and could sort of like alter its, its behavior well it still needs to be considered because there's one thing that we talked about it is that uh, every subject needs to have the same chance for being assigned the same condition 
So let's say you have a cage with five animals and you have a list of these conditions there that you need to assign. So the first animal, of course, then would have the one in five chance. So, but the rest, this probability of being assigned is lower and lower and lower until the last animal, yeah, just gets what is left over. And that is basically a bad technique. Again, we talked about this, 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 this randomness uh, that we need in the assignment. Uh, it's just not uh, there anymore. Therefore, the right to, to do this is assign an animal IDs to all animals you know, that you want to have in a study. Uh, you create a randomization table, for instance, with GraphPad Prism or with um, the GraphPad website better um, um, or other randomization tools. And then basically you merge the two tables in one step and then you have uh, um, assigned the, these treatment conditions. And of course, if you then use a blinding technique, you need to do this also in a blinded fashion. So, but many people ask me then, it's like, well, you know what? I always use these conditions A, B, C, D, and you know, it's uh, is that really good enough? And um, I always say then, well, it depends really. I mean, it is clearly not really ideal, but let's say if a, a device or a machine is producing your measurements without any of your interaction, uh, this simple coding scheme is probably sufficient. Um, um, but if you, uh, um, your judgment sort of like fully or even partially is determined by a human, then you need to use a coding scheme. And uh, why is this? Uh, well, again, the coding basically that you use this ABCD is prior information that can influence uh, future measurements. If you if every sample gets a different unique code, for instance, a four-digit alpha generic uh, alpha numeric code, um, it uh, it it is a code that is really hard to break and uh, is so random that um, you uh, really makes it unique. And these can be generated in Excel, and I also provide uh, this Excel table that can generate these. So what steps should I take to incorporate blinding into my study? Um, well, here's, for instance, uh, an example where I have a, 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 a certain population of samples where I assign a treatment uh, gr uh, group and I have these conditions, um, you know, like I have like uh, um, three different conditions here and um, and uh, the unblinded person assigns these different codes you know to to these conditions uh, often numeric codes and this is what the blinded person then basically uh, receives here um, um, at um, at this step um, and so the assignment for instance of m11 to this uh, often numeric code uh, and this is then also then applied as a single dose vials in a blinded way. And also the measurement is done in a, in a blinded way where you, where you, with these single doses. And then only for the analysis, it is then revealed uh, which of these single doses actually belong to the same group. And after the analysis is done, then you can say like, okay, uh, this group uh, M1, M1 and M6 uh, actually belonged to the aspirin group, for instance. So this would be the ideal way uh, to maintain blinding from the beginning to the end of an experiment. So, but then people have not such easy studies that I just uh, showed you because they are pretty complex and they sometimes involve many people that help. How can I really best ensure binding here? 
Well, my suggestion is to create a blinding plan, which is, you know, a simple Excel table uh, that lists every uh, uh, step of the research uh, um, um, con that's going to be conducted uh, from the planning till the uh, uh, statistical analysis and the unblinding and the participants uh, that are involved. And uh, then you can see basically also think about uh, who's involved in, in what stage and who is actually blinded and who is maybe unblinded or partially blinded. So this really helps you also to, uh, um, to, to plan out your research uh, in, in a way to maintain of uh, uh, blinding throughout here, especially from the PhD student that is fully blinded. And uh, it's not just the con conduct of the experiment that counts, it's also the transparent uh, reporting. And uh, it's best quoted here in this paper that states that blinding is rarely tested. Uh, tests methods vary and the reporting of tests and test results is often incomplete. There's a considerable methodological uncertainty how to best assess blinding and an urgent need really of improved uh, methodology and improved reporting. So please consider this because uh, often I read in, in publications that blinding was applied uh, um, and that uh, experimenters uh, were not uh, aware of the conditions. But how did you make sure? What did you use? And uh, um, this is basically my take on this. So you need to tell in your reporting which of these steps were really blinded. Was it the allocation, the interventions? If yes, which interventions? Was it the assessment? And the analysis was applied and was blinding maintained throughout the entire course of the study yes or no and how was blinding achieved at certain steps did you use a color coding was it a letter coding did you even maybe switch codes or did you use alphanumeric coding so a few sentences can really help a lot to make this uh, uh, more transparent and descriptive also for others to learn about. And of course, at what steps was blinding not possible and why? So it could be the physical properties of a solution or an animal phenotype uh, that is so clear that it uh, cannot be blinded. For more information on this also, please consult the ARRIVE 10 Essential Guidelines. A few practical uh, hints. So uh, blinding should not lead to mis mistakes. So don't make things too complicated uh, just to prevent blinding. It should be still <coughs> relatively easy to perform and also relatively easily explained to others. Of my hear from others, my experiments cannot be blinded because this is in this condition. So think about creative solutions. Think about preparation. What if I had help at a certain step? Where could this help come from? Uh, and you will find out that uh, blinding is most often actually possible. Code animals or treatments in such a way that it's really impossible to identify the treatment or the treatment group. And for bigger studies, do a dry run of each step to check whether blinding is potentially compromised. And beware of these time-saving practices that often compromise blinding and the validity of your studies that I see often. For instance, housing animals that are uh, receiving the same treatment in one cage. Then basically your experimental unit and the unit that you need to evaluate is the cage, not the individual animal anymore. Or often uh, sham uh, group surgeries are performed just in one batch. 
or always at the end of the experiment because it saves time. Again, a clear bias uh, that you have in here. Or if you load an entire plate just with uh, one condition, try to avoid that. Is there anything else that I need to do or need to know to reduce experimental bias? Yes, number four we haven't talked about, the inclusion and exclusion criteria. So it is needed to have a predefined valid range for your results. And they should be set already at the planning phase. You know? So a range of accepted values uh, of a physiological uh, range or uh, results from previous experience coming from you, uh, similar uh, um, design in literature or from your lab. You need to apply these criteria in a blinded fashion to prevent bias, because often the same uh, uh, value, uh, value range, um, could be an outlier or an awesome drug effect that you're looking for. Ideally, is really to uh, uh, pre-register your study to create a public record or even private record. Uh, for the inclusion and exclusion criteria and your entire uh, setup so that uh, um, um, no last-minute outcome switching is possible. That doesn't mean that it really uh, cuts your, your freedom. You can still analyze uh, data in the way that you want. So you can say, well, I exclude this value because I believe this was an outlier. But if you are reporting this outlier with the value, others can see this. It's transparent. It explains your decisions. And maybe somebody else that uh, believes that this is not an outlier you know, can analyze the data in a different way. So again, you if you are transparent and, and open, uh, that's the best way. So, to summarize, um, how to combat experimental bias. Randomization, use a computer-generated list, either from the web or in Excel. Blinding, apply it at least at the assessment step. Better throughout the experimental uh, uh, experiment, plan it and test it first. Concealed allocation, separate sample ID allocation from the assignment uh, of the treatment group and apply them in one step. A priori inclusion exclusion criteria, define accepted criteria and values before you start your experiment. Okay, now I'm at the end of the lecture and I'm coming to some exercises for you that you should also prepare for class. I have uh, three to four problem sets. Problem number one. You have to inject intraperitoneal uh, 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 rodents with a drug solution and assess their pain threshold maybe five minutes later. Uh, one of the solutions is slightly yellow, indicating this could be probably not the control. How can you design the experiment so that you can assess the outcome in a blinded manner? How many design strategies are you able to come up with? Problem two, the live imaging microscopy system automatically generates files that you need to manually assess for cell density measures. The system generates files with a date and time in its name, which is a problem because you know the time course of events and the drug solutions for each day. Is there still a way for you to assess the videos in a blinded fashion? Problem number three, good sample, blinded sample IDs. So I have a few of them listed here. Why or why are they not good examples? Can you come up with better solutions? So and if all these are no problem for you, because you see through this and have the solution right at hand, I have a fourth, the escape room level problem set. Again, you have to inject rodents with a drug solution and assess their pain threshold 10 minutes later. 
You have four different conditions, so there are four different drug solutions to prepare. The drug solutions have to be made fresh because one of the drugs is not stable long-term in solution. It happens to be that the experiment falls on a Sunday and you know that you will be alone in the lab with no help. Is there still a chance with some preparations prior to Sunday that you could still be blinded during the behavioral assessment? At your disposal, you have plenty of Abendor vials, a pen, aluminum foil, and some racks. Can you do it? And with this, I'm at the end. And I'm looking forward to seeing everyone in class. And thank you for your attention.